Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Our speaker this morning is Dr. Thomas Constable. He is our senior professor of Bible exposition, and he is the founder of the uh, Dallas Seminary Field Education Department that began in 1970. He began the Center for Biblical Studies, our ministry to our lay folk throughout the community in 1973. And uh, he directed both of those for many years before assuming other responsibilities. He served as the director of our uh, Doctor of Ministry program for a number of years and then chaired our Bible Exposition Department uh, for uh, the last decade or so. Dr. Constable continues to maintain an active uh, academic as well as pulpit uh, supply ministry, conference speaking uh, around the world. He's ministered in nearly uh, three dozen countries and has written commentaries on every single book of the Bible. Uh, He also helped uh, plant a church, which he pastored for 12 years, and then has served for one of its elders for over 30 years. He and his wife, Mary, enjoy traveling, snow skiing, and uh, visiting with people, especially our graduates. Uh, We deeply respect our colleague for his walk with Christ, for his competency in the scriptures, for his uh, incredible love for you as students and us as colleagues. Uh, Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Tom Constable to our platform? Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. That's what we all want. We want others to look at us, to notice us, to pay attention to us. Some people are very blatant about sending out this message. I have a friend who, when he wants my attention, positions himself about 12 inches in front of my face so that I can't help hearing what he says and seeing his lips as they move. Other people sometimes dress or act in ways that make it clear that they want other people to look at them. Others are more sophisticated about getting our attention. Their appeals for it aren't as dramatic. Sam does a good job on his, uh, at his place of employment, so his boss will notice him and perhaps give him a promotion or a raise. Sally works hard at running, hoping that others will notice her and praise her. Chris behaves as he does in and out of class, in part to be noticed by his classmates and teachers. Martha Ostenso wrote of Edith, who lived in a world, she said, bounded on the north, south, east, and west by Edith. I suppose some of us want to be noticed because we have some deep-seated feeling of inferiority and we think that uh, if people pay attention to us, we'll feel better. Some of us may hurt so badly on the inside that we need some comforting strokes and getting attention meets that need, at least temporarily. But I'm really not here to psychoanalyze our egotism. I think if we're honest, with ourselves, we'll all have to admit that we want to be noticed. I confess that's true of me. Growing up as an only child, as I did, didn't help suppress that desire. A friend sent Mary and me this bit of wisdom earlier this week. People want the front of the bus, the back of the church, and the center of attention. The Bible confirms this fact of human nature, that we all want to be noticed. It warns us of pride over and over again. It condemns self-centeredness repeatedly, and it gives us plenty of illustrations of people who were narcissistic and shows us what a terrible fate they typically experienced. 
Think, for example, of King Saul or Jezebel or Nebuchadnezzar. Well, this morning, I invite you to turn to Job chapter 32. The book of Job says that Job was the most upright man of his day. The writer introduced Job as blameless in his conduct, upright in his dealings, God-fearing, one who turned away from evil in all of its forms. Job got a lot of attention and praise from God and from his peers for good reason. He deserved it. But he also drew Satan's attention. And Satan accused Job of living righteously to obtain God's favor. So God allowed Satan to remove many of the blessings from his servant, claiming that Job would still follow him. The bulk of the book of Job contains the record of Job's monologues and dialogues with the friends who came to comfort him in his afflictions. They all accused him of living a double life and of being a great sinner. But Job consistently claimed that he was not a great sinner. He admitted that he sinned and that he wasn't perfect, but he argued that his punishment, as he saw it, was all out of proportion to his crime. He never claimed to be sinless. In some of his speeches, he sounds very self-righteous, but his point was that his suffering was far greater than he deserved. In the course of his ordeal, Job cried out to God many times, look at me, look at me. He felt that God had abandoned him. He felt that the former intimate fellowship that he had enjoyed with God was gone. Why had everything in his life that had previously been roses and honey now turned out to be thorns and sour apples? Why had God allowed him to become a social outcast when previously he had been admired by everyone who heard his name? Why did he feel so alone in the world? Look at me, he cried to God. Pay attention to me. Help me. For a long time, Job received no reply from God. God didn't rush to explain his actions to his faithful suffering servant. He let him flounder. And this time of frustration <laughs> created a teachable moment in Job's life. To Job's credit, throughout this entire period of intense suffering, on every level of his personhood, Job never cursed God. He never repudiated his faith in God, and he never turned his back on God. In fact, he kept seeking God. I've observed that people who undergo severe, unexplainable suffering usually react in one of two ways. Either they draw closer to God or they turn away from God. Job kept seeking God, and I suspect this is the reason that he didn't lose his mind since his suffering was so intense. After it had become clear to Job that, or rather to Satan, that Job was not serving God for what he could get out of it, but because he loved God, the Lord did speak to Job. Job had been crying out for God to pay attention to him and to listen to his cries of anguish and despair. He wanted God to look at him, to have pity on him, to relieve him, to vindicate him. God's gracious response to Job was, look at me, look at me. God had his eye on Job through all his afflictions, but Job hadn't really been looking at God. He hadn't been meditating on God very deeply. He hadn't been thinking about his creator. 
He'd been looking mainly at his own sufferings, at his unhelpful, hurtful friends, and most of all, he'd been looking at himself. And now God said, look at me. In chapters 38 through 41, God asked Job about 70 questions. Job had previously asked God many questions about his sufferings. Now God responded with questions of his own. As we all know, when you want to confront a person with something distasteful, it's more gracious and often more effective to put the confrontation in the form of a question rather than in the form of an accusation. And the fact that God posed questions to Job is a sign of God's tender and gracious treatment of his servant, who now needed the healing touch of the great physician. God addressed Job as he who darkens my counsel with words without knowledge in chapter 38, verse 2. He who darkens my counsel with words without knowledge. In other words, God described Job as one who actually obscured God's revelation because he lacked a broad, comprehensive perspective of God's ways. Job couldn't understand what God was saying to him through his sufferings because Job had only a limited understanding of God's ways. He had not really known God very well at all, even though he was the most righteous man of his day. For example, he knew, apparently knew little or nothing about Satan and spiritual warfare. So God proceeded to teach Job the limits of his knowledge of God and his ways by asking him questions, first about the structure of the world and then about the maintenance of the world in chapters 38 and 39. God gave Job an oral exam that covered aspects of cosmology, oceanography, meteorology, astronomy, and zoology. Before the second part of the exam, the Lord gave Job a break. He gave him an opportunity to respond. By previously arguing the correctness of his own position so tenaciously, Job had implied that God needed to be corrected. Now God gave Job the opportunity to do so in chapter 40, verse 2. But having so, done so poorly on the first part of his oral exam, Job realized that he'd better keep quiet and just listen to what God had to say to him. Rather than trying to justify himself, he realized that he needed more enlightenment. Rather than trying to get God to look at him, he realized that he needed to look at God. In his second speech, in chapters 40 and 41, God raised questions about Job's power. If Job couldn't subdue two of the earth's most powerful creatures, behemoth and leviathan, he couldn't possibly prove that God was treating him unjustly. Well, Job failed his exam, but he learned a lot in the process of taking it. He learned that God's wisdom transcends the ability of human beings to comprehend it. We do not and cannot understand why God does everything that he does. God has re revealed some of the cause-effect relationships that he has established in running the universe, but many of his reasons remain hidden from us. Second, Job learned that God's power is infinitely greater than our power. He can and does control things that you and I cannot, including our condition in life. And third, Job learned that God is gracious in his dealings with his creatures. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are but dust. But perhaps most significantly, Job learned that it's more important to look at God than it is to get him or anyone else 
to look at us. It's more important to look at God than it is to get him or anyone else to look at us. This section of the book of Job can be very helpful for us. I've talked to many students over the years who have felt that God had all but abandoned them in seminary. Some noted a remarkable change in their relationship with the Lord when they came here as students. For some, thankfully, entering seminary was a step forward from which they felt they went from strength to strength. But for others, seminary was one of the most difficult times for them spiritually. The close fellowship with the Lord that they had enjoyed before they enrolled was not the same in seminary. Some students have told me that when they stepped on this campus, their lives began to fall apart. I remember one student who told me that when he drove into Dallas from Phoenix, where he'd been living for some years, his car broke down. After that, he couldn't find a job in his profession. He was an architect. His wife couldn't keep her job, and they couldn't sell their house back home the whole time they were students here at Dallas Seminary. Perhaps coming to DTS has made you lose face. Some of you may have enjoyed the admiration of multitudes of people back home, like Job did. But here you have no reputation at all. Perhaps you've had to take a job cleaning toilets, as some of our international students, who were previously bishops over scores of churches in their homeland, have had to do. Some of you may simply feel very much alone. You've not been able to make close friends. You don't particularly like Dallas. You just feel lonesome. Now, Job experienced all these agonizing feelings and more. In the midst of your pain, you have undoubtedly cried out to God, look at me, do something for me. I need your help. But like Job, there may have been no response from heaven yet. If that's where you are, this may be a very teachable moment for you, as God's apparent abandonment of Job was for him. Learn from Job. Don't abandon God. Keep seeking him. Look at God. Sometime in the seminary experience, most students begin to realize that when you graduate, you're going to have more questions than when you entered. This isn't the place to get all the answers to all your questions. This is the place to learn to keep looking to the person who has all the answers. Job struggled with his circumstances because he didn't have a broader, more comprehensive perspective on God's ways. That's what seminary is designed to give you, a broader, more comprehensive perspective on God's ways than you had when you matriculated. Early in his agony, Job was eager to show what he knew about God and his ways. He had learned some very important lessons about this earlier in his life, and he believed his friends needed to profit from his wisdom. So he readily shared his insights with them. But as time went by, he learned that what he had learned so far was quite limited and in inadequate. He discovered that he needed simply to listen to what God had to say to him rather than to argue from his own limited understanding. Perhaps God waited so long to reveal himself to Job because he wasn't teachable during his early trials. He waited until all the theological experts had run out of gas, including Job. And then God opened up vast new horizons of appreciation through revelation. 
We too need a greater appreciation of God's power and His wisdom, His grace, and His ways. This comes to us through divine revelation, the Bible, in the context of teachable moments that God allows us to experience when we should become very aware that we have nowhere else to look but to Him. The feeling that I'm the most important individual in the universe has unfortunately been passed on to every one of us by our fallen parents. We're born self-centered, as any observer of young children can testify. Many well-meaning but misguided parents have encouraged this feeling. We're all familiar with the giant egos that are out there. These are the people who constantly cry, look at me, look at me. As Christians, we need to shift that focus from ourselves to our God, as Job learned. God is inviting us to look at me and be saved all the ends of the earth. He's inviting us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. How can we do it? Well, I suggest that we cultivate habits that will help us keep looking at God more frequently and consistently. How about training yourself to talk to God after you finish talking to someone else on your cell phone? You can train yourself to do that. Or after you send a text message, talk to God. How about asking the Lord to give you a greater understanding of Himself and His ways whenever you read His Word, making that an intentional matter of prayer? How about asking a friend to ask you what you've been learning along these lines once a week? Basically, I think it involves prioritizing Bible reading and prayer in our daily lives, giving these things a more prominent place in our activity. Because it's more important to look at God than it, get, than it is to get Him or anyone else to look at us. May our Lord give us the grace to look at Him more this semester and for the rest of our lives. Will you pray with me? Loving Lord, we submit ourselves afresh to you again this morning. We thank you for all that you have taught us about yourself and your ways in the past. But we also acknowledge that we understand only a fraction of what there is to know. Help us to keep looking to you and listening to your word. When we don't understand what's going on in our lives, help us to trust you. Help us to be more God-focused and less self-focused. Help us to look to you in your word to learn better of your ways, more than glorying in what little we know. Please give us a broader, more comprehensive perspective on yourself and your ways as we go through this semester, we pray in Jesus' name.